This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. In this edition of the Oncogene Brief, we talk about colorectal cancer. Our program today is the first of a three-part series about the disease, which is the third most common cancer diagnosed in the United States. It is also the second leading cause of death from cancer that affects both men and women. According to the American Cancer Society, the overall lifetime risk of developing colorectal cancer is about 1 in 22 for men and 1 in 24 for women. But in many cases, the disease is preventable. And prevention starts with awareness and accurate knowledge. This month is National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. This initiative started in February 2000 when President Bill Clinton officially dedicated March as such. Since then, this annual event has grown to be a rallying point for the colorectal cancer community, where thousands of patients, survivors, caregivers and advocates throughout the United States joined together to spread colorectal cancer awareness by wearing blue, holding fundraising and educational events, talking to friends and family members about screening, and do so much more. I'm Peter Hofland, Sonia Portillo is on assignment, and this is the Ongesing Brave. Colorectal cancer affects people in all racial and ethnic groups and is most common in people age 50 and older. But it doesn't have to be. The good news is that colorectal cancer screening is saving lives. If everyone age 50 and older got regular screenings, 6 out of 10 deaths from colorectal cancer could be prevented. Communities, health professionals and families can work together to encourage people to get screened. The nation's oldest and largest non-profit dedicated to the disease, the Colorectal Cancer Alliance, is encouraging everyone to support National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month so the disease can be knocked out of the top three cancer killers. Public health efforts such as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's campaign, Screen for Life, and the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable, 80% by 2018 campaign, encourages screening tests for men and women aged 50 years and older. Unfortunately, Recent data from the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable shows that one in three adults aged 50 to 75 is not getting screened as recommended. And that is a problem. Another concern is that colorectal cancer is significantly higher among minorities. And African Americans have higher mortality rates and higher incidence rates of colorectal cancer than all other racial or ethnic groups, except American Indians and Alaska Natives. Colorectal cancer is also the second most common diagnosed cancer among Latinos, and fewer than 40% of American Indian and native Hawaiian adults have ever been screened for colorectal cancer. According to the National Cancer Institute, the number of new colorectal cancer cases and the number of deaths from colorectal cancer are decreasing a little bit each year in adults aged 50 years and older. But in adults younger than 50 years, There has been a rapid and alarming rise in colorectal cancer incidence in recent years. And here is another problem. According to survey results presented during the preview of the annual meeting of the American Association for Cancer Research, or AACR, which will be held later this month in Atlanta, Georgia, many patients diagnosed with colorectal cancer before age 50 were initially misdiagnosed. And this misdiagnosis may lead to an ultimate diagnosis at an advanced stage of the disease. Unfortunately, the cause of the rising incident in young patients remains unknown, and there is little awareness of this trend among healthcare providers. So, why does National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month make a difference? That is what we will be talking about in today's episode of the Oncogene Brief. In our program today, we talk with a number of experts about colorectal cancer. And later in the program, we also talk about how to raise awareness about colorectal cancer and how to use this month of March to take action towards screening prevention. And we call on you, our listeners, the communities, the organizations, the families and individuals, how you can get involved and spread the word. In today's episode of the Oncogene Brief, we talk with Dr. Paul Berggren and Dr. Daniel Jondal, both from Arizona Digestive Health in Phoenix, Arizona. Dr. Berggren and Dr. Jondal are involved in the screening, diagnosis and treatment of colorectal cancer, as well as prevention of the disease. As said, 
This program is the first episode in a three-part series about colorectal cancer. This series is developed in collaboration with our online journal, Oncozine, that is www.oncozine.com, where you can find additional information and the latest news about colorectal cancer. One thing you will hear a lot about in this program is screening, prevention and diagnosis. We talk about colonoscopies and other tests that may be available to diagnose colorectal cancer. What is the most effective strategy? What are the costs associated with these screenings? Does insurance cover all these screening tests? In this three-week series, we also talk about disparities in healthcare. And we talk about the patients that come in for screening. We talk about what happens when additional evaluation is required. And we talk about what happens when cancer is found. What are the potential treatment options? Later this month, we also talk about common misconceptions about colorectal cancer. We will ask our panel of experts about these misconceptions and how they help to unravel them. If you're just joining us, today in the Oncosine Brief, we talk with Dr. Paul Berggreen and Dr. Daniel Jandel, both from Arizona Digestive Health in Phoenix, Arizona. Let's listen to the interview. I'm here with Dr. Paul Berggreen and with Dr. Dan Jandel. Both are working for Arizona Digestive Health. Let me start with um, you, Dr. Berggreen. Can you tell me a little bit about your background? Sure. Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. I am a gastroenterologist in Phoenix. I've been here for about 30 years now, and I'm part of Arizona Digestive Health, which is a very large group of gastroenterologists primarily involved in the diagnosis, treatment, and hopefully prevention of many gastrointestinal diseases. Originally went to medical school at uh, LSU in New Orleans. Afterwards came out to Phoenix for my training, uh, residency, and fellowship. Decided that I liked the place, so I decided to stay. And I've been here ever since. Right. Dr. Jungle. Uh, Yes, so I am a gastrointestinal pathologist. So that means that I uh, sit at a microscope most of the day and look at the biopsies that are taken from my gastroenterologist partners. Um, when patients have issues that require endoscopy, they are scoped with an endoscope by our gastroenterologist, and sometimes those uh, procedures result in biopsies, and they send them to my laboratory, where I look at them under the microscope and uh, diagnose uh, what I see. My training for this, my training to be a gastrointestinal pathologist included uh, a general pathology residency uh, in Denver, and then a uh, gastrointestinal pathology fellowship in Cleveland before coming here to Phoenix about 15 years ago. So both of you are, uh, I would almost say, natives of Arizona. As, as good as it gets, yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, it's, it's very hard to actually find people in Arizona that are actually born in Arizona or actually have been living for such a long time. It's uh, interesting to, to hear that. So both in the area of gastroenterology, part of that, that's part of digestive health. Let's first start a little bit to talk about digestive health in general before we're going to jump into areas like cancer. What are some of the things that make Arizona unique in, in, in digestive health, in, in concerns that you as physicians may have in terms of uh, differences in treatment uh, in, in, in the Southwest versus maybe other parts of the United States? Interesting question. What you just referenced in the fact that Arizona has a population that tends to be from all over the United States. So we have people from every state in the union who've come to Arizona for the weather or jobs or whatever. So our patient population is not that different from the rest of the country. I mean, I think you can say that we're fairly um, generalized. We do see the normal things. Um, I mean, a big part of our practice is going to be colonic problems, colon cancer screening, prevention, polyps. But we do other things uh, from, and from really from stem to stern, whether it's stomach ulcers or gastrointestinal reflux, things like celiac. Uh, we take care of liver diseases, pancreatic problems, gallstone problems, anything in the small intestine, whether it's a malabsorption problem, uh, and then anything in the colon, whether it's colon polyps and cancer to inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So the whole spectrum. And that, of course, includes cancer. Absolutely. Right. So, again, when you talk, talk about the communities you're in, um, very f- 
really wide variety of, of people in that respect. Um, anything that stands out may, maybe in the forms of diet uh, that may have an effect on, on uh, cancer or other digestive health issues that you come across often? Well, the, the problems that we see with diet are pretty varied. One of the concerns about risk factors for cancer is the American diet, which is high in processed foods, uh, high in fat, high in meat. And we also still see the high significant rates of smoking, which causes problems as well. But that type of a diet is typically something that is going to have a higher risk of cancerous problems or intestinal problems in general. Um, uh, as you know, Americans probably don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. We tend to eat a lot of fast foods and convenient foods and snack foods, which in general should be minimized. Right. And I can't, I can't stress, you know, I echo everything that Dr. Berger just said, and I can't stress the importance of high fiber in everyone's diet. And uh, oftentimes we refer to fruit and vegetables. I think it should be more referred to as vegetables and fruit. And vegetables should really be eaten at every meal uh, and fruits as well. And that should be the, the, the highest proportion of the, of the food that we eat, as opposed to the standard American diet, which, as Dr. Bergerin had mentioned, um, does include a tremendous amount of processed food um, and incredibly high in fat, high in salt, high in sugar, and uh, very, very low in fiber. Let's take a short break here. And then we talk some more with Dr. Paul Bergerin and Dr. Daniel Jondel, both from Arizona Digestive Health in Phoenix, Arizona. Each day, researchers make new discoveries that bring us closer to the moment when all cancer patients can become survivors. Some days they take small steps. Others, huge discoveries lead to giant leaps forward. This progress, both small steps and giant leaps, happens with the help of clinical trials. Clinical trials are a fundamental path to progress and the brightest torch researchers have to light their way towards better treatments. And if you've been diagnosed with cancer, they may be your brightest ray of hope. Clinical trials introduce new hope in addition to the current standard of care by allowing researchers to provide participants access to cutting-edge and potentially life-saving treatments. So if you're interested in exploring new treatment options while helping to light the path for other patients, clinical trials may be the best choice for you. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more about clinical trials. Together, we can stand up for all of us. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. And welcome back. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Oncogene Brief. If you're just joining us, today in the Oncogene Brief, we talk with Dr. Paul Bergreen and Dr. Daniel Jondel, both from Arizona Digestive Health in Phoenix, Arizona. So I used to, I, used, I tell my patients this on a pretty regular basis, when because the diet is a hot topic, right? Everybody right. wants to know about diet. And I tell them, you know, we should be eating like they ate on Leave it to Beaver. You know, the show from the 50s and 60s when they sat down at a dinner table and they had their, their piece of meat or their chicken or their fish and a couple of veggies and maybe a starch and a glass of water or maybe milk. And nobody eats like that anymore. So I, I tell people that on a regular basis, they usually get a pretty big kick out of it, but it really is true. From where you are sitting, I mean, uh, is there a direct correlation, for example, between diet, uh, the ones that you refer to, like the healthy diet, but also maybe uh, the not so healthy uh, fast food diets and cancer, for example? Yeah, absolutely. Then yeah, I think there's that? a tremendous amount of data in the literature. It's hard to really refute uh, the amount of data that's that's already exists, and they continue to do studies that show uh, people who are overweight have a higher ch chance of, of developing cancer. Uh, people who eat high-fat diets, high-salt diets, high-sugar diets, high-processed food diets, all these characteristics of the standard, what we consider the standard American diet right now, all have, are risk factors towards developing all kinds of cancer, not just gastrointestinal cancer. Smoking is obviously a big uh, risk factor as well, as is uh, drinking too much alcohol. A little bit of alcohol is probably fine for all of us, but uh, in excess is not good. So it is very good to make sure that uh, the diet in that respect uh, is balanced. We come for a short break. 
And after the break, we're going to talk a little bit about money and finding out about uh, the cost of cancer before we're actually going to talk about cancer treatment itself. Dr. Berggreen and Dr. John Dahl back uh, to uh, the Oncogene Brief. So one of the issues that um, is really important uh, or guess has been um, discussed uh, during a lot of medical societies meetings, um, also by the American Cancer Society, is the fact or is the issue about disparities in medical care uh, or maybe even the way that people might consider being able to get treatment. Uh, an interview that we had uh, in 2018 with Dr. Otis Brawley. At that time, he was the chief medical officer of the American Cancer Society. We actually spoke about disparities in healthcare, not only cancer, but in, in a broader sense, um, and the effect it has on cancer treatment, but also about the future of cancer research and treatment uh, related to disparities. So when you look at disparities um, from where you're sitting, when you are here in, in Arizona, and you look at your patient population, what do you notice? What what concerns you, Dr. Jungle? Yeah, sure. I think from a, a diagnostic side, when it comes to disparities, uh, one of the things I notice is that we have a um, a pretty large population that comes from south of the border, or at least spent some of their early years south of, of the United States. And uh, one of the things that we've certainly noticed in my laboratory is that there's a really high percent of patients with Helicobacter pylori infections in their stomachs. And uh, fortunately, Helicobacter pylori doesn't usually uh, result in a tremendous number of symptoms or uh, downstream effects, but a lot of patients do have uh, reflux when they have Helicobacter pylori and they do have some other symptoms. And Helicobacter pylori can eventually lead to gastric cancer. And so uh, that's one of the things that uh, we're constantly looking for under the microscope to make sure that we find those organisms when they are present. And we certainly see a higher uh, proportion of our, our Hispanic population that has those organisms. And, and when you look at, for example, on, on that particular population and you look about disparities in healthcare, mm -hmm. in, in, in trying to reach them or does the fact that they may have something that is more traditional for the areas where they are in terms of, of health, um, does it have an impact on the way you treat in terms or you look at things? Um, does it mean that they may get a different form of treatment if they're here in the U.S.? Yeah, so it doesn't necessarily mean that treatment's going to be any different, but they certainly will have additional treatment if, if any, you know, any patient that has that infection will have additional costs because of the additional therapy that is needed for that diagnosis. Um, so that certainly uh, can have an effect, an effect on their pocketbook. The increase in incidence of H. pylori in Hispanic patients is, is well documented. It is classified by the World Health Organization as a class one carcinogen so when we find it, we do get rid of it uh, with uh, treatment courses of antibiotics, which can be complicated and can be costly. And so one of the questions here is, is there appropriate access to care and is there appropriate follow through once a diagnosis is made? Now, in general, access to care is something that's going to be more difficult for us to determine because we don't know the patients who are not coming to see us. Right. But, in, but in general... Access to care is the issue in disparities in health care. If you have health insurance and if it's good health insurance, then you can, you can get adequate care and get treated appropriately and timely. And if you don't, it's very difficult. And so it has a lot to do with socioeconomic status and access to appropriate health insurance. The treatment, once a, once a diagnosis is made, then you're making the assumption already that the patient has accessed care and is being followed up appropriately. So the treatment is usually not the issue. The treatment is getting the appropriate access in the first place. Right. And so if you look at your patient population, I mean, how many patients do you see uh, on an annual basis in, a, in, 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 that, in that area or... Yeah, so I, I work at the laboratory and I have a good sense for our entire practice uh, amongst all of our 50 plus gastroenterologists. We see at least one uh, patient a day at the centralized laboratory that's positive for Helicobacter pylori and sometimes two or three or four. So we're seeing, uh, you know, certainly over a thousand patients a year that are positive for Helicobacter pylori infections. And, and that is, of course, important when you look at not only about general digestive health, but also when you focus on cancer to try to prevent uh, the potential for cancer. Absolutely. You know, the what uh, Dr. John was saying was correct, that patients with H. pylori don't always have symptoms. Sometimes you find in they really are completely asymptomatic. But 
once you find it, you need to get rid of it because of its potential for long-term consequences of gastric cancer. Now, overall, that is more common probably in Asia than in the Americas, possibly a different strain of H. pylori, mm -hmm. uh, but it still is a significant health concern, and when it's found, it needs to be eradicated, definitely. Again, tell me a little bit more about the link in that respect between uh, the population, for example, and the risk of cancer. Um, is, is, does that mean, for example, that your patient population that may be from south of the border versus people that might migrate, migrate from other areas in the world, we have a lot of people that migrate from Canada, for example, does that have an impact on not only disparities, but also on the occasion of or the occurrence of cancer, especially when we talk about colon cancer or colorectal cancer? Probably not as much from westernized, industrialized nations, but there are disparities in healthcare access and therefore outcomes in America already. And one of the examples that I'll give you is that the current recommendations by the American Cancer Society for colon cancer screening is that all adults get a colonoscopy at age 50, average risk adults, right? That's with no family history of colon cancer, no symptoms, no pre-existing intestinal conditions. That recommendation has been in effect for, you know, 16, 17, 18 years now, and it's well recognized. The informal recommendation from the medical societies that has not necessarily been endorsed by the federal government, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, is that African Americans get screened starting at age 45 mm -hmm. because the studies in the past have shown that they have a higher mortality rate from colon cancer than other ethnic groups. And it's not completely understood why that is, but there does seem to be an access to care, access to insurance uh, component to that. Um, and so they actually have a recommendation out there that they that African Americans start getting screened at age 45. Now, interestingly enough, the American Cancer Society just last summer came out with the recommendation that all Americans start getting screened at age 45. That has not been adopted by CMS, and it's not been universally adopted by insurance companies as of yet. It probably will be in the coming years. How would that impact your work when in that respect? Well, right now, I mean, one, one of our big pushes in, in gastroenterology is to get Americans screened for colon cancer. Colon cancer is the second most common cause of cancer death in this country. And the vast majority of those deaths are preventable with appropriate screening. We had made a push in years past to get more people screened, and we had a goal of 80% screening of eligible patients by 2018. We did not make that goal. We're probably at about 66% right now, which is a lot better than it was, but we still have a ways to go. So we're still working on getting people screened, but right now a third of people who need to be screened are not being appropriately screened. I was just going to jump in and say, I'm 45. And according to the ACS, I'm due for a colonoscopy and I'm going to get one this year. And I understand Americans' hesitation, and I understand anyone's hesitation to get into colonoscopy. It doesn't sound like a fun procedure. But as a gastrointestinal pathologist, I look at the devastation that cancer causes every day under the microscope. It's rare for a day to go by that I don't diagnose cancer or one of my partners doesn't diagnose cancer. And it's surprising to me how young some of the patients are. And so even though, and I haven't checked with my health insurance company yet, uh, even though they may not pay for the procedure, I am going to go in at 45 and get my first screening done. And, and the reason why they may not pay for the procedure is because you're not 50 yet. My understanding is that most uh, insurance companies have, has, have accepted the 50 as, as a reasonable time to get screened, even though one of the main cancer societies, the ACS, has has, uh, as of last summer, uh, uh, promoted that it sh the age should be lowered to 45. Insurance companies are notoriously slow at changing their regulations or their, uh, their rules if it's going to cost them more money. And I can understand that. Uh, you know, they need to, they have a bottom line as well. But I'm going to call my insurance company and hopefully they're going to say, yes, I, they'll uh, pay for it as a screening procedure. Uh, and if not, even if it's going to cost me money on my pocket, I'm going to go do it because mm -hmm. it's just too... It's too preventable of a, of a disease to ignore. Let's take a short break here 
And then we talk some more with Dr. Paul Bergreen and Dr. Daniel Jondel, both from Arizona Digestive Health in Phoenix, Arizona. Some of the best sounds you'll ever hear are generic, safe, effective, even money-saving, just like FDA-approved generic drugs. Even if they don't come in the exact same color or shape as their brand name equivalents, they have the same key ingredients and go through a rigorous review process. Talk to your doctor or pharmacist today and visit fda.gov slash generic drugs. Generics are safe, effective, and can save you money. You'll like the sound of that. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. Welcome back. I'm Peter Hoffland, and this is the Ongezine Brief. If you're just joining us, today in the Ongezine Brief, we talk with Dr. Paul Bergreen and Dr. Daniel Jondel, both from Arizona Digestive Health in Phoenix, Arizona. The reason that the American Cancer Society changed their recommendations to 45 is because of recent studies in the last several years that have shown an, a very interesting and disturbing shift in the prevalence of new diagnoses of colon cancer to patients under 50. That's a new thing. And the reason that, that we settled on the, diagno- or the age of 50 back in 2000, 2001, is because that's where the cutoff was. The studies were done saying 50, and certainly people over 50 have a higher incidence of polyps that will progress to colon cancer. And so you find them and you get them out of there and you're preventing colon cancer. This is a new thing for us that we're seeing people in their 40s and 30s diagnosed with colon cancer. That was in in past decades, I've been doing this for a long time, in past decades, that was really rare. It's not nearly as rare now. Yeah, it's, it's every month that I'm diagnosing somebody with colon cancer under the age of 40. And uh, every time I diagnose somebody in their 30s with colon cancer, I wonder why I haven't gotten a colonoscopy myself. Before the break, we were talking a little bit about the different options of screening, about the availability of screening. We were talking a little bit about the cutoff time in date in, in, in terms of uh, when one should get an, an, an colonoscopy or another screening option. Uh, 50 was the cutoff date for most right now. Uh, 45 may be a better time to do that. Um, Dr. Jonal, you've referred to the fact that you see a lot of people um, who uh, where you might diagnose um, a colorectal cancer on an age that is way below 50. So let's let's talk a little bit about the different options, screening options that are out there. First of all, colonoscopy. We talked about that. Before we go into different areas of uh, um, screening, tell me a little bit more about colonoscopy so that our audience understands a little bit, maybe take away their fear, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. So the good news is that colonoscopy, while in, in years and decades past, has gotten a reputation as being a very unpleasant test. With advances in the procedure itself, the scopes, the the way that we do the procedure, the preparation before the procedure, and the medications that we give for sedation, this procedure has become remarkably simple. I started doing these in 1991, and back then it wasn't so simple. It was sometimes a relatively unpleasant test, and that's, I think, where a lot of the reputation came from. But we use lower volume preps. So they're much more palatable, and a lot of times they either are or taste just like Gatorade, so not that big of a deal. Only one day is required off from work because the prep day, which is the day before, you don't start the prep till 6 p.m. in most cases, so you start after you get home from work. The procedure day is simple because you come into the outpatient facility and you get an IV and you get some medication that makes you take a nap, and it's a very pleasant nap, and so it's a painless procedure. The procedure itself can last 20 to 30 minutes for the complete exam. The medication that we give for sedation is turned off and patients wake up remarkably quickly, completely fresh, without a hangover. And because most centers now use CO2 for insufflation of the colon to keep the colon open instead of just plain air, um, that gets reabsorbed. And so there's actually not much in the way of cramping, bloating, or gas after the procedure. And so patients are no longer nearly as hesitant to have colonoscopies when they hear that it has improved a lot. Wow. And that's, that's really a big plus. <laughs> Sign me up. No, you're, you're, you're for a nice surprise, uh, Dr. John. Glad really to hear are. it. Very glad to hear it. 
Well, it's definitely good to hear that. It, it might take definitely away, take a little bit of the fear away from people. Yeah. I think that's always important if you consider a medical intervention or a diagnostic intervention or screening. Often the fear is the biggest enemy in this case. Um, so if we can take away that fear for people to understand, it's a necessary thing to do. It, I'm not going to say it's a necessary evil because, I mean, it's apparently what you just mentioned, Dr. Barry Green, it's, it's something that is relatively painless and without a lot of uh, side effects. In that, and that is a good thing to know. Absolutely. Now, besides the colonoscopy, there are a lot of other potentials to screen and diagnose uh, cancer. One of them is, uh, is a brand name is uh, Cologuard. It takes a little bit of your stool. Tell me a little bit about that. Tell me a little bit about maybe the differences between a colonoscopy in, in what you see, what you can diagnose. Uh, is there any difference in that respect? Um, what are some of the benefits for patients versus some of the benefits for, for doctors? Before we delve into anything specific, let me give you a big picture overview of the options because I think it'll help to put things in perspective. So there's a there's an entity called the U.S. Multitask or the Preventative Services Task Force. And in 2017, they came out with their formal grading of recommendations for colon cancer screening in the average risk American. And so there's three tiers. And tier number one tests is colonoscopy, which has been felt to be the gold standard for a long time now. And then there's the old stool test called a fecal immunohistochemical test. So that's, the, test. that's the pre-runner of uh, colon, colon guard tests. Correct. So that tech, that's, a, that's a test that checks for microscopic amounts of blood in the stool. So a colonoscopy is recommended at age 50 in the average risk American and once every 10 years if it was a negative exam. So it's a very easy schedule to follow. The FIT test is a stool test, which is a card collection test, mm -hmm. basically. And you just collect some stool at home, you send it in, and they do some testing on it. And that's done once every year, as long as it's negative, And that's been felt to be a reasonably effective tier one test. So tier two tests include what's called a CT colonography, which is a, basically a CAT scan of the colon. And the old name for that was virtual colonoscopy and back in the day. That is a reasonable test. It has some drawbacks. It's got limited accuracy. It still requires a prep. It still requires uh, air insufflation into the colon. And it has limited, the, the main problem is it has limited accuracy. It does give you some radiation as well because it is a CAT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. Right. So that's a tier two test. The other tier two test is a Cologuard test. So a Cologuard test is actually two tests. It's number one, a test for DNA in the stool coupled with a FIT test. And Cologuard is a relative new test, been out for a few years now. And it is a very reasonable test to obtain in people who are average risk, meaning no prior history of polyps, bleeding, any problems, and specifically in people who don't want a colonoscopy or for medical reasons cannot undergo a colonoscopy. It is, and I'll stress this, it is a second-tier test. And the reason that it's a second-tier test is because it has its limitations as well. And one of the big limitations is an almost 8% miss rate of colon cancers and clinically important precancerous colon polyps. And that's one of the big concerns about tests that are done for screening is how accurate are they? Um, we're screening large populations of patients, and we need to have accurate tests. And I'll, I'll chime in for a second here. And when I think through all my physician friends who are, you know, at the age where they need to get screened, I don't know a single one that does anything but colonoscopy. And it's I think that's because of the fact that physicians know the data and have read the data and have read the differences between these tests. But, you know, Paul, you can chime in too. Do you have any friends who... Are physicians that would opt for anything other than a colonoscopy? No, not at all. Um, one of the concerns, uh, one of the other concerns about the Cologuard testing is that of all positive Cologuards who end up having a colonoscopy, 45% of those colonoscopies are normal. So you're, you're talking about a, what we call a high level, high number of false positives. False positives, exactly. And, and that comes, of course, not only with cost, but also with... Um, People being afraid or significant being anxiety levels. Anxiety, yeah. Correct. And so the answer is it is a reasonable test. 
And, and anything that gets more people screened for colon cancer, we're in favor of, as long as people understand the limitations. The other tier two test is actually an older fashion, an older type test, which is the flexible sigmoidoscopy, which is basically a, a short version of a colonoscopy that looks at only at the left side of the colon. Um, and that's an older option. It's a reasonable option, but it does not screen the entire colon, which again is why it's a second tier test. And then one of the things that uh, people uh, in, in media, but also in uh, uh, medical societies are talking a lot about lately is liquid biopsies. Right. Uh, taking a little bit of blood and try to, uh, with a very uh, ingenious kind of uh, um, sequencing, try to find out um, if there is cancer. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, you know, they're still working out all the details, so I don't know that there's a lot for us to say about it uh, at this moment because there's not a test that's, that's, that's available. But certainly as physicians, we are... Uh, very, uh, you know, we're cheering on the development of new tests that can find, that are better screening tests than what we currently have. Um, and so, uh, you know, hopefully the day will come when there is a, a liquid biopsy test for colon cancer and precancerous lesions that will have higher sensitivity and higher specificity. So thereby being a, a much uh, better test than what we currently uh, compare it to the gold standard of colonoscopy. Let's take a short break. After the break, we're back with our interview with Dr. Paul Berggreen and Dr. Daniel Jandel. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Ongus in Brief. Each day, researchers make discoveries that bring us closer to the moment when all cancer patients can become survivors. Their progress is made possible with the help of clinical trials. Clinical trials are the brightest torch researchers have to light their way towards better treatments. And if you've been diagnosed with cancer, they may be your brightest ray of hope. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more. Together, we can stand up for all of us. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. And welcome back. I'm Peter Hoffland, and this is the Ongus in Brief. Our interview today with Dr. Paul Berggreen and Dr. Daniel Jandel, both from Arizona Digestive Health in Phoenix, Arizona, was originally recorded on Wednesday, February the 27th, 2019, in Phoenix, Arizona. If, if you look at those, those standards, if you look at um, those new potential new tests, like, like liquid biopsies, Somebody uh, last year at, I think it was either the AACR, the American Association of Cancer Research Meeting, or it could be an, another meeting, uh, mentioned to me that um, one day you walk into your doctor's office um, and you will uh, be asked, do you want to also be screened for cancer? Um, and within a reasonable time, we know if you have a higher risk for cancer or if there is cancer. And then we can already start uh, looking at treatment options in stages or in in, in ways that cancer may be very early in diagnosis. We can actually look at it in a very early phase, potentially. Is that something that is far away in the future? We talk about maybe 10, 20 to 20, 25 years. Is that something that is closer by in, 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 in our future? My sense is that it's it's not closer by. My sense is that, uh, you know, for a, a good liquid biopsy test that even comes close to the... Um, uh, being anywhere near as good as a colonoscopy, we're at least five years away. Uh, you know, I'm not a researcher on the front lines knowing exactly what developments are, are being made in, in labs across the United States. Um, but this is my general sense of, of how slow science and medicine uh, move. And uh, my guess is that they, you know, we are probably 20 or 30 years away from being able to go in and just get that one blood test and find out everything we need to know about our current health state. It's, it's interesting in that respect, uh, a note from myself anyway, is that if you go to meetings uh, like the American Association of Cancer Research or other research meetings, um, you get sometimes a very futuristic feel about what can be done. And then when, when I'm talking to, to you guys, it's like that actually the, the people, the physicians that actually see patients there's a slightly different tone of voice. Well, I think that's that's probably true because we're dealing with the you know the troops in the field here. We're cheering on 
the researchers, you know, as much as we possibly can, but we have patients in our office right now that need to be taken care of. I'll also tell you that when I was in training, and this was in the late 80s, early 90s, we were doing research at that time on polyps in the colon. And we weren't sure that polyps led to colon cancer back then. Once we became sure of that, which was in the early 90s, it still took 10 years to convince Congress that this was enough of a health policy issue and a, and a public health issue to cover screening colonoscopies for med- Medicare and Medicaid patients. And then it took the insurance industry a few years after that to adopt those standards. So that, which was a relatively easy lift compared to what we're talking about, still took about a dozen years to implement. So we are certainly hopeful, but we have to deal with people who are in our offices today. I think it is coming. Right. And I think we'll, we'll see incremental improvements. I think there's, all, there's never a magic bullet, though, and there's always going to be limitations to whatever we do. But it's never the shining element that is in, 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 in the future. It is actually in, in, because you need to, to treat patients today. That brings us to how do you treat patients? And I think that may be a subject uh, that is a, a different program. Mm-hmm. Um, it's our follow-up program where we may be able to talk a little bit, uh, going a little bit back about diagnostics, but also really talk about how cancer is, is be, or colorectal cancer is being treated. Now, doctors recommend certain screening tests for healthy people with no signs or symptoms in order to look for early evidence of colorectal cancer. Finding colorectal cancer at its earliest stage provides the greatest chance for a cure. Screening has been shown to reduce the risk of dying from colorectal cancer. People with an advanced risk of colorectal cancer should consider screening beginning at age 50. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends that adults aged 50 to 75 be screened for colorectal cancer. Some professional medical societies recommend starting regular screenings earlier, at age 45. In addition to these guidelines, anyone with a family history of colorectal cancer should start screening 10 years prior to the patient's age at time of diagnosis, or by age 40. So, what does screening involve? Our panel today mentioned that there are several screening options, and each of these options has its own benefits and drawbacks. So, what can you do? Talk about your options with your doctor. Together, you can decide which screening approach is appropriate for you. If a colonoscopy is used for screening, polyps can be removed during the procedure before they turn into cancer. But other tests are also available. As said before, March is National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. So, if you're 50 years or older, or if you're younger but you have a higher risk of developing colorectal cancer, get screened. But where can you find accurate information about colorectal cancer? The Screen for Life National Colorectal Cancer Action Campaign by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention focuses on screening tests for men and women aged 50 years and older. The CDC website includes fact sheets with the basic information about colorectal cancer. Another resource is the National Cancer Institute's website, which provides information about colorectal cancer for patients and health professionals. In addition, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has developed an interactive tool to help people choose a colorectal cancer screening test. And if you want to know or want to learn more about personalized medicine and targeted therapies in cancer, including colorectal cancer, visit cancer.net. This is the website of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, or ASCO, and includes doctor-approved patient information. Another resource is the website of the American Cancer Society. This website offers a wealth of information about cancer, including risk factors, symptoms, how a particular cancer is found, and how it is treated. The website of the American Cancer Society is www.cancer.org. And finally, if you want to actively help share accurate information about colorectal cancer, visit the website of the Colorectal Cancer Alliance at www.ccalliance.org. This year, the Colorectal Cancer Alliance campaign, Don't Assume, is designed to raise public awareness. The goal of the organization is to challenge assumptions and misconceptions about colorectal cancer by dispelling myths, raising awareness, and connecting people across the country with information and support. 
For us here at The Youngest in Brief, we want to thank you, our listeners and underwriters, for your ongoing support. Thanks to your support, our program now has a wider reach with distribution via iHeartRadio, in addition to PRX Public Radio Exchange and in the United Kingdom and mainland Europe via UK Health Radio. You can also download our program via iTunes. In Arizona, you can listen to The Youngest in Brief via Independent Talk 1100 KFNX, one of the top 10 radio stations in Arizona, reaching almost 5 million people throughout the state. For more information about that, check our online journal, Oncozine, at www.oncozine.com. We know that based on this interview, the interviews we had with Dr. Berggren and Dr. Jondal, and the additional subject matter we've discussed, you may have questions. So please submit your questions to our editorial team via email, Facebook, or Twitter. We will post as many answers as we can on our website, Oncozine, that is O-N-C-O-Z-I-N-E dot com. To help make this program possible, please visit our page at patreon.com forward slash the Oncuzine Brief. That is P A T R E O N dot com forward slash the Oncuzine Brief. Your support for this program is important. It allows us to bring you interviews with experts involved in the development of novel diagnostics and new treatments. So please visit our page at patreon.com forward slash the Oncuzine Brief. If you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER, C-A-N-C-E-R, to 66866, and we will make sure that you'll receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. Thank you all, and thank you for listening, and join us again for our next episode. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Oncosine Brief. The Oncozine Brief was produced for Sun Valley Communication by Peter Hofflin, Sonia Portillo, Evan Wynn, David Kaler, and Sean Mayer, and distributed by InPress Media Group. Support for the Oncozine Brief comes from listeners of this station and our commercial underwriters and advertisers. For more information about underwriting and sponsoring options, contact Sean Mayer in California at 949 923 1660 or visit our website at oncozine.com forward slash underwriting. The Oncozine Brief contains health and medicine related information and is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended as a substitute for professional medical or health advice and does not replace your doctor's advice. Your doctor is the best person to answer questions about your personal health If you hear something in this program that doesn't agree with what your doctor has told you, ask him or her about it.